been sung for centuries at evening prayer called, from, the, the Greek title is Vos Hilaren, uh, which translates into O Gladsome Light. And the version that is on pages four and five we are going to sing tonight, it's a setting by uh, a Trappist, Father Chris Agnes Waddell, okay? Um, let me sing, uh, first Barbara will pay, play the melody and then I will sing the first verse and then we will take it from there, okay? This is the first verse. Light serene of holy glory from the immortal Father poured. Holy thou, O blessed Jesus, holy blessed Christ the Lord. Can we all try the first verse? As you can tell, the, it's really two verses that repeat melodically, okay? So let's just try the first verse. Light serene of holy glory from the immortal Father poured. Holy thou, O blessed Jesus, Christ the Lord. Verse 2. Now we see the sun descending. Now declines the evening light. And in hymns we praise the Father, Son, and Spirit, God of Wonderful. This is, by God, Wilbur, this is going to fly. Okay. Uh, for the Psalms tonight, we are going to do four Psalms. We're going to sing the first one, and it is Psalm 141, the incense psalm. Uh, during the development of the Liturgy of the Hours, cathedrals would usually start their, um, their evening prayer with Psalm 141. And what we are actually going to do is, as part of the prayer, light incense tonight. Uh, the cantor will sing the verses and everybody will sing the refrain and the refrain goes like this. like this. My prayers come before you like incense, the raising of my hands like the evening offering. You game to try it? Okay. My prayers come before you like incense, the raising of my hands like the evening offering. Wonderful. So uh, after we sing the uh, light serene, we will light incense. The cantor will sing the refrain once. We'll all sing it together. And then we'll all sing it together after the three verses. Okay? And finally, on page 11. At morning prayer, when we gather on Hol Good Friday and Holy Saturday morning, a fixed part of morning prayer, or lauds, is the Benedictus, the Song of Zechariah from Luke's Gospel. At evening prayer or vespers, the fixed canticle is the Magnificat of Mary. And uh, we're going to use a, a very simple chant tone for this. 
It's the same chant tone that we used uh, last year um, during the Triduum, okay? Uh, the cantor will sing the antiphon, then we will all join in on the, the, magni the Magnificat itself, verses one through five, and then we will repeat the antiphon. All right. Let me sing the antiphon once, and then we will we'll do the first verse together, okay? okay? It goes like this. Let us not, I'm sorry, Barbara. <laughs> Let us not receive the grace of God in vain, for this is the acceptable time. This is the day of salvation. Okay, everyone. My soul proclaims the goodness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior who looks kindly on me in my lowliness. All ages to come will call me blessed. That's it, that's simple, okay? Thank you very much for coming early. You won't make that mistake again. Thank you. O oh God, come to my assistance. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
looks tenderly on the poor. In the Lord I have taken refuge. How can you say to my soul, fly like a bird to the mountain? Look, the wicked are bending their bow. They are fixing their arrows on the strike to shoot the upright of heart in the dark. Foundations once destroyed. What can the just one do? The Lord inspects the just and the wicked, the lover of violence he hates. He sends fire and brimstone on the wicked, a scorching wind to fill their cup. For the Lord is just. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the 
Lord God, you search the hearts of all, both the good and the wicked. May those who are in danger or suffer for love of you find security and safety in you now, and at your coming in judgment, rejoice in seeing you face to face. The Lord looks tenderly on the poor and hears the cry of his suffering. <clears throat> Blessed are the pure of heart. For they shall see God. Lord, who shall abide in your tent and dwell on your holy mountain? Whoever walks without fall, who does with the upright, the Whoever does not slander with his tongue, who does no wrong to a neighbor, who casts no slur on a friend, who looks with scorn on the wicked, but honors those who fear the Lord. Who keeps an oath, whatever their cost, who lends no money at interest, and accepts no bribes against the innocent, such a one shall never be shaken. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. May we live our lives with integrity, Lord God. Instill in us your grace that we may do what is right and speak what is true, and so dwell in the safety of your tent and find peace on your holy mountain. God shows us in Christ. Adopted daughters and sons. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, in accord with the riches of his grace lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will in accordance with his good pleasure, which he sees forth in Christ as a plan. A plan. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. God shows us in Christ to be his adopted daughters and sons. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. People of Corinth, our heart is open wide. You are not constrained by us. You are constrained by your own affections. As recompense in kind, I speak as to my children. Be open yourselves. Do not be yoked with those who are different, with unbelievers. For what partnership do righteousness and lawlessness have? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What accord as Christ with the liar? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God said. I will live with them and move among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, Come forth from them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch nothing unclean. Then I will receive you and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty.
let us not receive the grace of God in vain, for this is the acceptable time, this is the day of salvation. My soul proclaims the goodness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, who looks kindly on me in my loneliness. All ages to come will call me blessed. For God, wonderful in power, has done great things for me. Holy the name of the Lord, whose mercy lasts from age to age. God scatters the proud, brings down the mighty, and raises up the humble. The Lord gives the hungry every good thing, but sends the rich away empty. The Lord rescues lowly Israel, recalling the promise of mercy, the promise made to our holy ancestors, to Abraham and his heirs forever. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be, forever and ever. Amen. Let us not receive the grace of God in vain, for this is the acceptable time, this is the day of salvation. United in voice and heart, let us offer our prayers this evening to our Father in heaven as we say to each petition, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That this, this Lent may be a time of healing and reconciliation for our families, church, and community, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That the spirit that led Jesus into the desert will lead us from self-centeredness to attentiveness to the needs of others, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That the peace and justice of Christ will free the people of Ukraine and all who suffer the crucifixion of war and the scourge of hatred, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That families in crisis may realize the love of God for them in our support and assistance, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That the God of mercy and compassion will be the refuge of the sick and hope of the dying, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That those who have died may will one day arise in the light of Christ, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That the Father of mercy will hear the prayers we now offer in the silence of our hearts. We pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In hope in the constant mercy and compassion of God, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God of love, the kind of fast that pleases you is to free the oppressed, heal the broken, and share our bread with the hungry. We offer you our Lenten fast. May it help us be one with those who are hungry, not from choice, but from necessity. May it open our eyes to see you in the forgotten, the suffering, the victims of violence and war. Hear our prayer in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to eternal life.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so let me start by saying that I had nothing to do with preparing the evening prayer service, which is very nice, but you probably noticed uh, Chrysologus Waddell is a Trappist monk. And then the other music was taken from St. Meinrad Arch Abbey, which is a Benedictine monastery in Indiana. So, uh, but I had nothing to do with that, which is fine. So they didn't do that because I was here. I think it is good in the interest of full disclosure that I should begin with two remarks. The first is that the first retreat I ever gave was such a resounding success, it was 18 years before I was asked to give another one. <laughs> that must have gone a little better because then it was only six years before I was asked to give another one. So my sense is that I am improving. The second element of full disclosure is that while I suffer from the effects of original sin, I do not suffer from the sin of originality. Most of the material that you will hear this evening is material that I have heard or read or seen somewhere uh, over the years. I collect uh, bits of quotes and ideas and put them in a file and I rarely write down who said them or where I got them from. So um, if you hear something uh, that sounds very familiar, it's not that I'm really attempting to plagiarize anything. It's uh, just the way it goes. So the theme that I chose for this uh, parish mission on Lent is stretching our hearts to the limits of God. So let me explain first where that came from. Well, every evening, uh, probably around 4.30, quarter or five or so, we, uh, we take about a half hour or so for spiritual reading in the monastery. Each monk sits in his, his room and does some spiritual reading. And the book I was reading at the time uh, was by an Australian Trappist monk by the name of Michael Casey. Uh, Michael has actually visited St. Anselm on a couple of occasions. Uh, he's from Tarawawa Abbey in Australia. Tarawawa. You say that five times fast and see how you do, all right? And it's in this book that I first encountered this idea of stretching the heart. Because first he speaks about Christ stretching out his arms on the cross. And then suggests that we need to do the same kind of stretching. He writes this. For some people, a catastrophe suddenly stretches their heart to the length of God. For other people, the experience is much more ordinary, much less dramatic. The stretching of their hearts to the length of God happens only gradually and over time. The beauty of God's love shining forth in the details of this wor world may only slowly fascinate their hearts in a contemplation that also only slowly imitates the mysterious fullness becking them beyond present experience. There is a need for us to stretch our hearts to the length of God, or to the limits of God. And we must be aware that this is a choice we make, a choice and a conversion which Michael Casey says is initiated and empowered first in baptism, which stretches over a whole lifetime. So I read that, this idea of stretching our hearts and so on was going through my head when I went to Mass. And then at Mass, we had this reading from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, in which he writes, we have spoken to you frankly opening our hearts wide to you. There is no lack of room in us. The narrowness is in you. In fair exchange then, I speak as a father to his children, open wide your hearts. I said, well, that's, that's interesting. I've been reading about stretching hearts. Now I'm reading about opening wide your hearts. And then mass goes on. And as you all well know and are familiar, uh, just before we start the Eucharistic prayer, we have the preface, 
And in introducing the preface, the priest says this, lift up your hearts. And we respond, we lift them up to the Lord. And I said, there it is again. But then I asked myself, do we really do that? Do we really lift our hearts to the Lord? Or is that just something we say because we've gotten so used to it over the years? And then after Mass, we go to dinner. And in the monastery, we eat in silence. Uh, and we have table reading. So one of the monks is up in the reader's stand reading to us. And we always at supper, we read a passage from the New Testament. We'll read a passage from the Rule of St. Benedict and then whatever book we happen to be reading. Passage from the Rule of St. Benedict was from the prologue that evening and in part included this verse. As we progress in this way of life and in faith, we shall run on the path of God's commandments, our hearts overflowing with the inexpressible delight of love. And I said to myself, there it is again. So this must mean something. So that's where I came up with the idea. Uh, later on, an image uh, kind of impressed itself on my mind. If you don't mind switching from one season to another, you all are probably familiar with the story how the Grinch stole Christmas. And you remember what the Grinch's problem was. His heart was two sizes too small. Are our hearts too small and unable to realize the love that God has for us? Unable to express the love that God asks us to express toward him and toward one another. So the theme started just going through my head and as I continued to read, uh, especially in the scriptures, uh, it just kept standing out more and more. The word heart occurs in the Old and New Testament over 200 times. You will never see the word brain in the scriptures, by the way, <laughs> because for the Hebrews, thinking took place in the heart. The emotions took place in the guts. We use that today, right? A gut feeling? Yeah, well, your emotions for them are like in the liver down here and the kidneys and so on. What matters most takes place in the heart. So I would like to just read some scripture verses to you. Some of them may be familiar, some of them not. But to me, it suggests that this is a very important idea that we should be thinking about. Probably the most familiar is from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Notice that that's a promise. They shall see God. Sometimes it's translated, blessed are the single-hearted. From Psalm 37, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Psalm 51, which we used at the Mass yesterday, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 119, which is a psalm in praise of the law of the Lord, which above all commands love, I will run in the path of your commands, for you have enlarged my heart. From Proverbs, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. This one I just threw in because I liked it. The wise in heart accepts commands, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. So. Hopefully I'm not chattering too much tonight. Also Proverbs, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up bones. From Jeremiah, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. From Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. From the Gospel of Matthew again, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. From the Gospel of Luke, 
A good man produces goodness from the good in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of a store of evil. So taken all together for me, all these references and so many more, call us to be remade in the image and likeness of God. That we are made to love even as God has loved us. Love of all, even of enemies. Love them and pray for them, Jesus tells us. You must be made perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There was an, uh, excuse me, an English uh, philosopher, novelist, uh, by the name of Iris Murdoch. She was also an atheist. She said the problem with Christianity was that very line that Jesus said. You must be made perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. She said Christianity would have gotten a lot more traction if he had taught, be slightly improved. <laughs> but we aren't asked to be slightly improved. We're asked to be perfect as God is perfect. So though there's some references from scripture, here are some from non-scripture sources. St. Augustine, our hearts are restless and will not rest until they rest in God. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, of course I'm going to refer to a monk, right? Absolutely. It is necessary for the soul to grow and be enlarged until it is capable of containing God within itself. But the dimensions of the soul are in proportion to its love, as the apostle affirms when he urges the Corinthians to widen their hearts in love. Although the soul being spiritual cannot be measured physically, grace confers on it what nature does not bestow. It expands spiritually as it makes progress toward human perfection, which is measured by nothing less than the full stature of Christ. So it grows into a temple sacred to the Lord. The way of Christ is the way by which we measure our actions. This is from a Lutheran Advent hymn called Lift Up Your Hearts, Ye Mighty Gates. I'm not going to sing it. Uh, just uh, say the verses for you. You don't want to hear me sing. Uh, Fling wide the portals of your heart. Make it a temple set apart. From earthly use for heaven's employ, adorned with prayer and love and joy. St. John Vianney, the curé of ours, the uh, patron saint of priests, Prayer is nothing other than union with God. When your heart is pure and united with God, you feel within yourself a balm, a sweetness that is inebriating, a light that is dazzling. My children, you have a little heart, but prayer enlarges it and makes it capable of loving God. And then finally, from St. John Henry Newman, uh, 19th century cardinal in, in England, uh, John Henry Newman's uh, Episcopal shield, his motto on the shield was cor ad cor loquitur, heart speaks to heart. Now for Newman, the way it was set up is he's, he has three hearts on the shield and heart speaking to heart, he's talking about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I think we could be excused if we interpreted of our hearts speaking to the heart of God, God's heart speaking to us as well. By the way, Corrad Corloquitur is not original from him. He stole that from St. Francis de Sales. But I think saints can steal from saints and there's no harm, no, <laughs> no harm, no foul, and something like that. What does it mean to be stretched in love? What, what is actually going on if we try to stretch our hearts to the limits of God? Well, I think it includes some of the following things and probably more than this. It is a willingness to let go of any and all negative feelings and judgments about others or about ourselves. It is a willingness to not be in control all the time. Now, Michael Casey, whom I referred to, wrote a book on humility. He's written, I don't think he has an unpublished thought, actually. 
but he, he wrote a book on humility in which he says, you know you have arrived at humility when you're willing to let someone else run the place. I, Father Bob isn't here, is he good? No, he's in here. <laughs> to stretch your heart means that you're willing to be hurt. It means you are willing to forgive at all times and in all cases. It means a willingness to be sincere in all that you do. Now, I read an etymology of sincere where the word comes from, which uh, people who are uh, uh, well-versed in, in literature tell me is a bunch of hogwash, but I like it, so I use it. Uh, it apparently, in the ancient world, in ancient Rome and so on, uh, people would buy little household gods to keep in the house. That was how to protect, protect the home. And these were normally made of bronze. But sometimes they weren't quite well done, so the, the artisans would fill in the holes and cracks with wax and then paint them. And they would look very nice, but they were. But if you could afford it, and you went to the right artisan, you could order one without wax, which in Latin is sine sere, sincere. And if we're going to be stretching our hearts, we need to be sincere about it. Uh, no wax. No wax. You've got to be thorough, complete through, or another word, perfection. To be perfect as God is perfect. None of this is easy. We like to control our hearts. We like to measure out our love. But the only way we will be fulfilled is to enter more and more into what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. And God as St. John tells us, is love. But God showed us how to do this. He showed it in Jesus Christ. Probably the best example of this is what happens at the Last Supper as described in St. John's Gospel. Jesus says to his disciples, I am indeed going to prepare a place for you, and then I will come back to take you with me, that where I am you also may be, you know the way that leads where I go. And then Thomas, the Apostle Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answers, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I am the way. Live as I have lived. Compassion, mercy, Forgiveness, reaching out to those in need, sacrifice, accepting and embracing trials, hardships, difficulties, even death itself, all for the sake of the kingdom. I am the way. God did not leave us trying to figure this out or trying to guess at what we should do. Follow Jesus. I am the way. Only in this way do we find that we can fulfill ourselves in the image and likeness of God, by the grace of God, if we stretch our hearts to the limits of God shown us in Christ. And that passage is in the same area where Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. And alas, there are no excuses. St. Peter writes, although you have not seen him, you love him, and without seeing, you believe in him, and rejoice with inexpressible joy, touched with glory, because you are achieving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We have his word. We have the witness of his disciples and holy ones through 2,000 years. No excuses. To stretch our hearts to the limits of God is to be led by the Spirit. And all who are led by the Spirit, St. Paul writes, are children of God. And he writes in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patient endurance, kindness, generosity, 
faith, mildness, and chastity. Since we live by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's lead, the Spirit of Christ. This is the way to be fully what we are meant to be, created in the divine image and likeness of God. We must stretch our hearts. One spiritual writer has written, this is one of these pieces of paper I have with no name on it, no book. To have had our identity stretched beyond our selfish limits into the fullness of God's faithful love and therefore to have renounced the world as one's identity center is not to lose the world. Rather, it reveals a whole new vision of the world as belonging to God redeemed in the mystery of Christ and with the Holy Spirit daily struggling to radiate the grandeur of God's reconciling love within the infinite variety of human affairs. All who are alight with the fire of God's love in the quiet intimacy of their heart must simply be part of this radiant daily struggle in the Holy Spirit. Again, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. My advice to you, friends, is to turn aside from troubled and anxious reflection on your own progress and escape to the easier paths of remembering the good things God has done. In this way, instead of becoming upset by thinking about yourself, you find relief by turning your attention to God. Sorrow for sin is indeed a necessary thing, but it should not prevail at all times. On the contrary, it is necessary that happier recollections of God's generosity should counterbalance it, lest the heart should become hardened through too much sadness and peevish through despair. We each have to find our place in this world, and each of us has to find a place where we can stretch our hearts so that we resemble more and more the heart of God. I can whisper, yeah. It is a miracle, thank you, thank you, Jay. 
I forgive you for all the things you did to me at college. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the teacher asked the students to come up with seven wonders of the contemporary world. So the students all busily writing down and doing all their thing. And they came up with such things as the Freedom Tower in New York, uh, the International Space Station, uh, the Internet, and things like that. But there was one child who just kept his head down, didn't say anything, and finally the teacher said, stand up, tell us what you wrote. So the child stands up and he says, the seven wonders of the world to see, to hear, to taste, to touch, to smell, to laugh, and to love. The ability to love is a wonder. It's a wonder, it's a gift given to us. And it's something that we should use to stretch our hearts so that we can love as much as God loves to stretch our hearts to the limits of God. Thank you very much, and uh, drive home safely, and hope we'll see some of you tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, just so you know, folks, regardless of what's happening with the snow, we will continue with the, the uh, Lenten retreat tomorrow. It's going to be over a 24-hour period. We're talking about four inches, maybe, over 24 hours, so it shouldn't be bad at all. So if you can get out and come back, we certainly would encourage you to do so. So have a good night, and uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow.